Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. With coverage reaching all the way back to 1948, for over 70 years, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Now, Fate Magazine Radio is carrying on that tradition of setting the standard in paranormal talk radio as we report and discuss some of the most mysterious and perplexing phenomena imaginable in this strange world of ours. Now, here is your host of Faith Magazine Radio, Kat Hobson. Good, good evening. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and you are listening to Faith Mag Radio, the online voice of Faith Magazine, here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I am so interested in her show tonight, and you will be too. My guests are Ronald Meyer and Alan McGargle. They produced the Bigfoot Alien Connection Revealed, which got over 2 million views in five months. I think that's pretty astounding. So I'm going to suggest that you go look at it. It is a fantastic piece of information as well as entertainment. I found it very informative. It also um, featured Rosemary Allen Gulley, who was brilliant in her field and a well-loved member of the FATE team, as well as my friend Stanton Friedman. And Ron, but I'm so glad that you are here. Ron? Yes. Good to I be know, here. I'm, thank you. I know that um, y'all actually have a a new film coming up relevant to to the Rockies, and I am ready to see this. You know, I told you when we were talking the other day that I'm fascinated because I don't know anyone else who's done what you're doing. And that's what makes it so fascinating. This was not something that was easy. Y'all worked for over two years to try to create an alien portal, right? We did indeed. We, um, when we did the Bigfoot Alien Connection Revealed, we got the idea that there were these places like Dulce, New Mexico, mm-hmm. where multiple paranormal phenomena were occurring on a regular basis. And there seemed to be individuals involved, kind of local people who seemed to be the nexus of the activity. And we were wondering, is this something that is anomalous or are these things happening all over? And so we decided to to see if we could investigate and either verify this idea of paranormal hotspots. So if you, have you ever seen the Skinwalker Ranch series? I- I actually was into Skinwalker Ranch well before the sh- the series started. I have been researching that from a desk for probably about 20 years. Okay, so so for those who don't know, it's another place where although they have never seen a skinwalker, they have multiple paranormal phenomena occurring regularly in one area on the ranch. And uh, so that's kind of popularized the notion of what what we call paranormal hotspots. And in this movie, we set about looking at it in two ways. One, we think, we thought, we hypothesized that there was a place in Bailey, Colorado. Remember, this was during the pandemic, so we had to operate close to home. We couldn't do a lot of traveling. So there's this this place called the Sasquatch Outpost in Bailey, Colorado. It's a small Mm -hmm. mountain town. And this guy, Jim Jim Myers, for some reason, just started growing this thing from a little tiny portion of a 
of a, mer a mercantile store that he and his wife bought into this fantastic Bigfoot museum. And I had the idea that he was channeling this. Wow. The, as you probably know, have you ever f heard of the Integratron in California? I have. So it's sort of like that, that Van Tessel channeled the building itself, the growing of the building. And it attracted many kind of UFO observers, as you know, over the years. So I, I, we had the idea that maybe Jim is, something's working through him to create this this um, Sasquatch outpost, which has become like a magnet for all sorts of paranormal phenomena. And we could describe these, or how would you like to proceed? I would actually like for you to, to just describe them, because I have had experiences that led me to believe that all paranormal activity, regardless of type, is correlated in some fashion between ghosts and cryptids and UFOs slash aliens. The whole topic, to me, is just fascinating. So did you interview Ray Hernandez yet? I am actually interviewing Ray next week. He's, he's a huge proponent of that idea. So so we we started out with Jim and did some interviews, and it turns out that he has he had no idea why he kept growing this darn thing, the Sasquatch outpost. So we asked him, would you be willing to kind of be a focal point for, for part of the film we're doing? The second half is when we tried to open our own paranormal hotspot, and we'll, we can talk about what happened when we did which was quite amazing and quite surprising. So one of the ways we, you know, we, we tried it. To, so we, we, had our, we had already, in fact, Jim was the one that kind of alerted me to that Bigfoot might be paraphysical when I did another earlier series called Chasing Bigfoot, which you can yes. find all over the place. Um, so we, we got to be kind of friends with Jim so we could make this work on, a, on an easy basis. And one of the things we did is we tried a shaman to see if she could get the source. We're looking for the source of what's driving the growth of the of the um, the outpost. And one of the ways, of course, is to see if you can contact with the source through through a channeling medium kind of person. And that didn't work. Um, Jim was having trouble settling down, and uh, it just didn't work. Not everything works, right? When you go about it, but we filmed it and uh, said, and we were honest saying it didn't work. So the next thing we did is that we tried to use a couple of the ghost hunting tools. You want to talk about that? The two things that happened that were quite unusual when we we tried that. Alan, I would like to because I know that a lot of paranormal researchers don't like tools because they say that's not what they were designed for so you can't utilize them that way and I say hogwash to that particular notion because some things are multi-purpose but I would love to hear what y'all found doing that with with this yeah. area because it's so active so Ron you're referring to the outpost or yeah the outpost when, yes. when you brought yeah. in when you when you brought in your spirit right. box and the two two things that happened that were quite interesting. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll back up just a little bit. That when when I started doing this approach of research with Ron, because um, I'm a traditional Bigfoot investigator that's mm -hmm. been flesh and blood guy for a long time, so this was a switch to me. Um, I sort of ripped the bandaid off, and you know the paranormal kit goes in the car now when we go to look for Bigfoot. So all of the the gear we use when we're looking for ghosts and haunted buildings and all that stuff now comes with us. So. Um, we've been utilizing that equipment when we're in the woods and when we're out doing Bigfoot stuff. So in this case, we were at the outpost and uh, I used the spirit box, which is, you know, sort of a white noise generator. <clears throat> and you can, you know, sometimes hear voices and, and things come through there that uh, we believe could be communications from spirits or in this case, whatever entities we're dealing with. So we were using that with, with Jim and a, a couple of things happened that were unusual to me is the uh, the spirit box sweeps the different radio frequencies so it's a very consistent um, flow and you can hear a little a little break in the static as it switches frequencies so it's a uh, it's it's very consistent but in this case when we asked a question the 
the the sweep got really slow just on its own on its own <clears throat> yeah for just a couple seconds twice yeah yeah maybe through maybe five or six sweeps just super slow like maybe a third of the normal speed and then it just sped back up to the regular speed it was very strange and i never i've never experienced that before so that was the sort of the that happened twice so that was the first sort of anomaly with the spirit box and then the next thing um jim started asking a question and the last word of his question was the word that came out of the spirit box just before he could say it so whoever we were talking with literally finished a sentence right in front of us and that really blew us all away and we just sort of chuckled but yeah, another surprising and an unusual moment with that piece of equipment yeah so he, he asked the question is my guide and the spirit box answered here <laughs> oh my gosh really and, and so with regard to the the slowing down it would be the sort of thing that that something was messing with the electronics but at the same time since we filmed it we could see that the lights and everything else that was connected you might say electronically nothing unusual was happening and and one of the one of the more interesting aspects or a pattern that emerged because we've we're doing a series called the paranormal highway and we travel to multiple places across the country investigating these hot spots and every place we go there's some there's something that happens that messes with technology or electronics it's really bizarre because that's a little a little harder to explain and of course, when you're filming, you can see it. So it's it's a different kind of contact experience, if you want to call it that. There's well, no reason there's no reason that that piece of electronics should have slowed down like that. In fact, we didn't even know there was two of them. The first one was pretty obvious, kind of freaked Alan out. And then we went back and looked at the footage. There was actually an earlier one as well, by about four or five seconds. So it's sort of like sort of like whatever it is saying look we're pretty powerful we can we can mess with your technology whenever we want so then the next thing that happened there is that uh a couple moved in and, and bought an, an old resort called Glen Isle and they started you know bringing it back to life and it's in Bailey and it's just a short distance away maybe Quarter of a mile, would you say, Alan? Or you yeah, know? it's just down the road from the outpost. And I had an experience in my head of a female ghost, and then Alan and his team did an investigation, and they found a female. And then the proprietor of the place had a very profound experience with the, the same friendly female ghost. So so that's another event that's sort of happening nearby in, in Bailey, kind of adding to the multiplicity of paranormal activities in one location. And of course, Jim had actually done some, some gifting with Bigfoot earlier during the, during the building up of the, uh, the outpost. But then uh, Alan has been operating a, a thing called the, what the Bigfoot weekend. What is it exactly? Again, the title. Yeah. Me and uh, my, my business partner, Jesse Morgan um, work with Jim Myers on a, uh, so Bigfoot camp out weekend that we do actually at Glen Isle, there's a camping primitive camping area there and it's called Bigfoot adventure weekends where people can pay and we'll feed you all weekend and take you out to all the Bigfoot hotspots. And um, it's, it's a place where people are interested in Bigfoot, but haven't really been out or don't know the right people or the right places can actually go and have their own Bigfoot experience. So it's a really cool event that we do. And well, so that's how y'all met, isn't it? It's through, Ryan, you going on one of the Bigfoot experiences. That's right. He came to Ohio, and that's where we first met. Yes. That was a while ago. That was for Chasing Bigfoot back in 2017, I believe, or 2016. 2016. So, yeah. So that's that's how we met. And as you might imagine, we would, since we had filming, we, we thought with all these people there that, you know, we should start getting some activity paranormal activity and a few things happened um one of them was a pretty profound experience of eye shine uh do you want to see what that is alan yeah so um some of the members of our group um were out you know late at night out in the woods and they could see what looked like glowing eyes or glowing orbs that were self-illuminated coming from inside the woods looking towards the group 
Um, they weren't they weren't red or anything like that, but there were just these two sort of glowing eyes that people could see, and 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 they had their lights turned off and everything, so it wasn't like we were getting normal eyes. Right. It was more um, metaphysical eye shine, if you will. Was it that pie? It seemed, it seemed uh, to go ahead, John. It, it it seemed to be maybe at about in in a stand of trees, maybe about six seven feet. Wow, yeah. that is tall. But but one of the most profound things that happened was that there was a small group. Uh, well, first first of all. There, there was one of the places they went to is, um, you know, the mountains are quite mountainous, and there, there's a, a ridge, and uh, during the day people went up there, and they found a footprint, right, Alan? Yeah. So what we do is we, we we set up these night operations, and then we go during the day to those locations to scout them out before we go back at night, and uh, the this group went up there and they they found a footprint in the ground. So I met up with them and. We went up and, and poured the plaster and cast the footprint. It was a, a pretty clear print. It wasn't huge, but it was. It looked like a bare foot. There was just one, and it was way up off trail, up the side of this mountain, just in some loose sort of pine needle soil. Um, yeah, so so they, they cast it, and when they went back that night, um, I wasn't with them that time, but uh, they, they approached where the, the plaster cast was still in the ground, and it had been pulled up. And the dirt side was now facing up. So it was right next to where the impression was, but pulled out of the ground, which was really interesting that whatever was up there didn't like that, I guess. And they, and they pulled or, it out of the ground. Or they just thought it would be fun to mess with you, or they were tired of having concrete in their fur. But we <laughs> have to take too. our first break. So everyone, we will be right back. If you have questions, get them into the chat room. We'll see you on the flip side. Warning, the following message does not necessarily reflect the views of WBHMDB or its hosts, guests, listeners, or of any functioning adult in general. In fact, Frank should probably seek professional help. Listener discretion is advised. Hi there, Frank Lee here. I thought that I would spend a few moments telling you about the positivity from the network here. Uh, the overall message of para unity and happiness and how everyone here wants to get along with everyone out there and how everything is just wonderful. Wait, cat's not looking. Uh, okay, I've got something to really tell you. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what's really going on. Honestly, all that being nice and positive crap is kind of hurting my soul, as dark as it is. So, what's really happening? Well, you see it all the time. Everybody and their brother out there has a paranormal team because they watch a couple of episodes of Ghost Hunters or some crap like that. So they go and they spend half their mortgage payment on tools and things that light up that they don't understand. And then the next logical step after buying matching black t-shirts and posing like 90s rappers for their Facebook page is to of course have their own podcast well you know what you're not gonna find that crap here what we have here at wbhm digital broadcasting is the best host the best guest bringing you real information all of the hosts here on this network know their stuff they are the people who have been out there doing the work doing actual research and no by research i don't mean binge watching some kind of cheesy tv show on netflix i mean reading books i mean out in the field doing the labor and who are they interviewing on their shows they're bringing you the people they have learned from they're bringing you the best in the field covering all kinds of topics from UFOs and aliens to Bigfoot to cryptozoology to ghosts to anything you can think of a bit strange and unexplained it is here and you're going to get the best information here so 
stay tuned to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Don't go anywhere. Speaking of going somewhere, I've got to go before my mic gets cut. We'll see you there on WBHM DB. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. I am Kat Hobson, your get, your host, as my friend Rick is wont to say, the voice of Fate. Although it's a little bit rough voice today, I am probably just way too excited about my guests, Ron Mayer and Alan McGargle, and we have been talking about their experiences utilizing paranormal tools or traditionally paranormal tools out in the Sasquatch outpost area and you know I was really impressed with the fact that that this was slowing down your spirit box and other things but when we went to break I had to kind of interrupt you would you like to just pick up where we left off sure so we're up on this ridge where the footprint was found, and this is at night. And two, of, one of the team's participants of the of the team that went up to the ridge saw a blue orb, and they each, with their still camera, got a picture of it. And one, and one, one, one of the people, Kenny Collins, he got a picture. It's kind of your typical amorphous blue orb with no with no in, interior structure. And people could argue that that was backscatter, which is what a lot of photographs of orbs are. But the other person, Art, he had he had no flash. He took he it was his last picture on, that he clicked, and it's in the same spot as the other one Kenny did, and it's it's blue and has incredible structure to it. So, in some sense, we may have they may have photographed a uh, for the first time an orb which they then felt some sort of kind of Bigfoot creature emerge from. So the one, the one that Art shot is, is quite remarkable and matches some of the other kinds of light phenomena that were part of other series that are, on, are playing right now, the same sort of structure. But the other thing that happened on the ridge is we took, we took Jim up there with divining rods and he was kind of being led around and we got, we got a, we used the spirit box again. We got a clear voice of a, a child. And then after a while, we got another clear clear voice, which Alan heard. you want to say what it said? <laughs> sure. So, yeah, um, Jim was using these dowsing rods, asking where it was, you know, and you can ask yes and no questions. And it, he said, could I, could I see you if I knew where to look? And it, it said yes. So, so where are you? And it sort of pointed around, and he wandered around for a little bit and never really could see anything. It was like it was playing with us. And then we brought out the spirit box and we asked a few questions and we didn't really get any response. And I was like, you know, what, what do you want us to do now? And the spirit box said, leave. Oh. So we left. So, so we left. <laughs> well, that's what I would have done too. If they tell you, you kind of have to honor that. So, so we kind of concluded that the, the outpost in Bailey, Colorado is becoming what we would call a paranormal hotspot. But on the other, but then the other half of the movie is that we had the idea that maybe we could create a paranormal hotspot on a piece of property I own next to Estes Park. It's 40 acres of pristine wilderness, it has all the animals and plants and ecosystem of the big park and the national forest that surrounds it. And our first indication we had that there might be something like Bigfoot there is uh, we found some footprints which in the snow, uh, they had, they weren't clear because they had, you know, had melted somewhat. But the odd thing about them is that they seemed to originate out of nowhere from an anthill, mm -hmm. and then they traveled along. Alan followed them for a while, and then tell them what happened when you got to a tree. Yeah, I followed them pretty much straight up the side of the mountain. It was very rocky. Um, and a tough climb. And when I got up there, the footprints continued. Um, and they went to the base of this tree, probably no more than maybe five inch, six inch in diameter. So a fairly small tree, maybe 10 feet tall, 15 feet tall. Um, and they just stopped. And uh, 
I looked up <laughs> and there was nothing there. I looked all around to see if the print, the prints continued anywhere. And there was just no sign. It was like they, they went to that tree and, and just disappeared. So we thought, well, and, and plus a few other people that own properties up there mentioned that they thought Bigfoot was there, but then we went, did we talk to you about it? Nah, no, we don't want to talk about it. So the next thing we did was we brought some, some Bigfoot. Oh, hold on one second, Ron. The, the prints actually started, the he, like you mentioned, by an anthill, but just behind the anthill was a fairly large pile of animal bones with meat still on them. And as we searched around the area, we ended up finding maybe four, I think four or five more piles of these. It was a large animal, a moose maybe. Yeah. So, so they seem to have started near that, what we call the bone pile. Right. And, and it, there's a stream nearby. Uh, Little Thompson drains out of the mountains there. And the next thing that happened, we brought some of the local Bigfoot researchers up to the property for a night. At least Alan did. And we filmed that. And we got some wood knocks and some other kind of messing around the tent, kind of the, the usual sort of thing that happens. But then when we were filming for the movie, um, we we were we were in a place in, in uh, called the Owl Moon Lab in in Oregon, which is in the in the movie Bigfoot Alien Connection revealed. And there was a couple there that said they had opened a portal on their land. And we asked them, "Well, what did you do?" And they gave us some instructions to try and make this happen. And one was to create a ritual and an intention to invite activity or to invite whatever might be there to play with us. And we used a drum and you can describe that Ellen, cause it's your drum. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. So I met Tobe Johnson when we were there cause he was sort of the lead investigator for the Owl Moon Lab. And uh, they had recovered a, a sort of a side leg and knee print. And when they were casting it, they pulled several hairs out of it. And they had those hairs analyzed uh, forensically, not uh, DNA sampled. And and the only sample in the in the database that it was it was close to was one that was purportedly a baby Bigfoot. So they believe that these were Bigfoot hairs. So his girlfriend and him they they make these uh, Native American style drums. So they took an elk hide and some energy crystals and some Bigfoot hair, and they soaked this hide in there with the solution. So um, it's quite possible that the drum has Bigfoot DNA in it. And then Tobe um, drew his artwork for his, his podcast on there. So I purchased the drum. Um, we brought it back to Colorado, hoping that some of the uh, Oregon Bigfoot mojo would kind of rub off here and we could maybe make some connections that way. It's a brilliant idea. So whenever we went there, we would beat the drum three times three three times in a row saying hey we're here we want to play we want contact and we also tried the, the typical technique of of gifting which meant are you are you familiar with gifting i am so our but our, our listeners may not be okay so in this particular case um remember this land that we have is gate locked and nobody can really get into it unless you're an owner and and so we decided to take a bunch of feathers, put them in bottles and place them around different places on, on our property and see if anything would take them out of the jar and move them around. And after maybe like three times, was it the third or fourth time we came back uh, for the first three times or two times, nothing happened. Everything was still there. But when we came came to this one, which was the closest one to our road. Um, Alan reached in, pulled out the bottle, and guess what, Alan? Say. <laughs> yeah, so the, the area had been disturbed, and the, the feather had been removed from the bottle. The bottle was still upright in there. So I was sort of stunned because, you know, something would have had to take the bottle, shake the feather out, and then put the bottle back. And this was tucked up in an area that no people would have found it. It was definitely out of, out of vision. And then um, I looked around and, and sort of down below by maybe a few feet, three, four feet, uh, I found the feather and it was perfectly stuck um, in this crevice. 
that was right below it, sort of a crack in the rocks. The the original regifting. Yes. So that was that was exciting for us. And then on that very same day, we had been using the dowsing rod saying, where's the portal? Where's the portal? And it always said we wanted it to be by the bone pile on the north side of the of the little Thompson. But they kept pointing and saying, no, it's on the other side. We didn't like that. But because of for whatever reason, Alan was motivated to go to the other side where the where the the rods were pointing to, there was a a, a very interesting rock formation. So Alan went there and as he was going there, have you heard the concept of being sizzled? Yes. It's, it's when something messes with your cognitive capabilities in a variety of ways people report. So he got sort of sizzled going there towards the, to the uh, what we thought was might be the portal. And he, he did get there and uh, didn't did you find ever find anything or was it just there was this hole in the middle of these rocks, right? Yeah, once I got up there the, the dowsing rods kept pointing to this one patch of rocks. No matter which side I went, I walked all the way around it and they kept pointing to that that rock. And it happened to be the one rock that was too tall and really wasn't a way to get up there. So um my deduction from that was they they picked the right place because <laughs> it was a little bit tough to get to. But uh, I did go back there the next time and I was able to to sort of climb up there. And when I got to the top of the rock, I was really surprised to see that there was a perfectly round, maybe five foot diameter circle carved out of the top of the rock. Oh my. So I took some measurements with the meters and things like that. And and I didn't get any unusual magnetic or electromagnetic measurements. Um, But you know, it's possible. I, I think that maybe there's a way that activates and, and something can come in and out through up there, but um, we weren't able to really get that to work in any way. So time passes and we go up there still, still COVID time. And we go up there, I think it was in October or something like that. And uh, we check, we're going to check our gifting site and what we found right at our gifting site next to it was a mutilated deer. Okay, I stand corrected on the regifting. <laughs> there there's the regifting. And that was so weird to us. First of all, there was no drag marks, so we there was no way that we could see how anything had been dragged there. And uh that kind of freaked us out, as you might imagine. I would say. And we we all just kind of like i don't think we were kind of kind of dazed by that the coincidence we, we were. the the deer had had no head and the legs were broken clean or cut or cut they were they were clean no marks of saws or or no no ragged edges they were the 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 legs were broken clean and and the the strangest thing was that there was no no blood anywhere. It was just one carcass, no parts anywhere. Just, Oh my gosh. It was the very strange. It, it, it wasn't killed there and it wasn't dragged there. It was almost like it fell out of the sky or something is sort of what we deduced. And well, there were no, no footprints around it. Just there it was. So, so it came through the portal possibly. We don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's few ways that could actually have gotten there. And when you eliminate the probable, then you have the improbable. Yes. That's, that's so interesting. So we decided, this was on one weekend, so we decided to to put a trail cam on the, on the, on the carcass to see if we could catch anything. And uh, did, did we bring Kenny up before or after that? Or did we put the trail cam up after Kenny came up, right? So we yeah we went up the following week and we brought some other people and I brought the trail camera so we put it up about a week later, and, and then we but it, it was then that we started taking some readings. Yep. And the thing that really we did two, we did three things. We looked for electromagnetic, and nothing. Then when we took out the Gauss meter, which me- measures magnetic fluctuation, yes, it was crazy. It went off the off the charts, and as well we looked for radiation and we got. 
we got elevated radiation readings. So that was uh, like, wow, what in the heck's going on here? And, the, and at that point, the carcass was pretty much had been left alone for a week, wouldn't you say, Alan? Yeah, there was no signs of anything um, really eating on it. Um, the, the hindquarters had been cut as well. So some of the organs were, re, were had been removed when we first found it. But it didn't look like anything had chewed on it. Well, y'all had been out in the field doing this work on this topic for some time. How often have you found a carcass that was just left alone by predators? Never. never. I never have either. So so then we put up the trail cam. And we, and we went, you know, this is a weekend. It takes us about an hour and a half to get to our land, you know, driving up the mountain. And when we came back the next week, Alan pulled the files, you know, the, 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 uh, what, what, what is it? What kind of a device is recording? Is it a little thumb drive or something? I can't even. It's just an SD card. Yeah. Okay. So he put it in his computer back up at the car and they were kind of like some normal videos of animals at night and birds at during the day around. And then one, one of them was, all of a sudden, there's this kind of like old fashioned static you'd see from your television, mm-hmm. bright white, black, and the, and the, there was no color to the picture, and there was a dome shape image over over the carcass, and corresponding to our our magnetic readings, kind of the same dome shape, which was damn cool, and we yes. could see. We could see in the first one that something was, there was something moving in the frame that triggered the the trail cam, but nobody's ever seen a trail cam produce this kind of imagery. And then there was the next night, it occurred again at the same time. And we could see there was a funny little creature that uh, we would only, could only describe as like a baby brontosaurus with a, a neck. Oh my that gosh. Was, like a neck that was, kind of going, being pulled in and out and pulling in, in and out. And so we, ver- we, ver- we verified our, our, our that magnetic... That is so wild. Oh, my Isn't gosh. And we, we, have, we have still frames that we grab, and, we can, and you can see the thing move on our video and everything. So we did a one where we put the trail cam up against the next time. And this, this creature was off in one corner, right, Alan? It wasn't yeah. moving through the frame, but it was there moving. It sort of it's popped kind of... in from the left side and, and then disappeared or, or popped back out. It did this weird thing with its long neck, kind of like nothing exists like that as far as I know. So the next time we come back, uh, the, the readings are still there. We verified them again. And this time there was another around the same time at night. There was one more image. In this one, you could clearly see some really strange creature kind of waffling in and out of existence with a, a pig sheep type head, four legs, and like no creature anybody had ever seen on this planet before. So you were at a portal. See, like, Sounds like it to me. Sounds like we opened one and... As one of our colleagues said, they they wanted they wanted to show you what they can do. They're into- well, and on video, no less. But we yeah. have to take our second break. I am amazed. I remember that I'm so interested in what we're saying here. So we will be right back. Y'all come back to you, and thank you for listening to Fate Mag Radio. We'll be right back. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, 
I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hopson Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Hello there. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine, and I'm Kat Hobson. I have wonderful guests for you tonight, Ron Meyer, who runs, um, who owns Center Communications and has directed feature films, documentaries, you name it, and we'll go into a few of those titles for you when we come back at, after the news, and Alan McGargle, who has his own share of of skill sets and who does some beautiful work with uh, his filming as well thank you both for being here and those darn commercials you just have to take a minute but I'm glad to be back with y'all same now so sure go ahead well I was just going to say again I had to interrupt you and my apologies but would you please continue with the animals and creatures that you were seeing and and what came next? So what what came next is that it seemed like whatever was going on was all it was going to give us. When we came back, eventually after that, the the weird readings, the magnetic readings were gone. There was no more radioactivity. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it... it uh, it was it was done. Whatever it was, it done its thing. Now I don't know if these creatures are wandering the earth or what happened, but uh, um, in some ways, it's really strange. I was just talking to one of my friends and mentioned it to Alan that we were able to do this so easily. I wonder if other people are doing it. And one of the people I mentioned this to said, "Yeah, they probably are, and they're weaponizing it." Yes, which is tragic, but. You know, the fact that that you can do it, and obviously, if they can get here or get things to us into our dimension, whatever aspect you want to look at that as, um, then they're smart enough also to know. I mean, because these phenomena, you know, UAPs and such, have been reported around our nuclear facilities. They're very aware, I think, of what we have what we can do with it as well as basically I'm amazed that we have them because we we weren't able to behave just with regular weaponry you know so having nuclear makes me nervous I'm sure it it would make other beings from other places that we could affect nervous too oh there's there's one little aspect that was so so when we were putting together the movie quite a bit later Mm-hmm. Real, really, half a year later, we were getting getting some uh, comments on it from Tom Powell, who put us onto this idea of paranormal hotspot. And like four or five times, he said, "I think what they're doing is they're sort of giving you a bone, kind of as a metaphor, right?" Right. So the next time we go back, we go back to the you know the there's nothing there. We walk down the hill a little bit. And there's a perfect leg bone sitting there. 
like almost they heard our conversation. That would not surprise me in the least. What kind of bone was it? It was a deer bone. Okay. It was it certainly hadn't been there before because it was right along the the trail that takes us down to the little Thompson. There it was perfectly sitting there like, hey, we heard you talking to Tom about a bone, so we'll give you one more bone. Yeah, it was just a foot. <laughs> just a foot. <laughs> just just the foot. Well, yeah. at least they have a sense of humor. <laughs> exactly. That's Tom's idea. They have they're playing with us and have a sense of humor, whatever they are. That's the key question, right? Whatever yeah. they are. So subsequently we have the new five part series coming out called The Paranormal Highway. And we've we've visited at least seven other sites and documented all sorts of things like this, including maybe even the the Beast of Bray Road. I don't know if you ever heard of that. A time or yeah. two. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do. I love it. So, yeah, we, we actually filmed something that may actually be the damn beast. It was pretty weird. Looking us right in the eye while we're shining lights on it. Talking oh, my about word. it. Um, there would be I no say? point to running at that point. No, it was small. <laughs> and, it, and it matched the uh, one of the four sets of footprints that uh, the owner of the property right next to Bray Road says he's found. Oh, we also we also got, I think, the best images I ever got at this place we call the sweet spot where all this activity took a place of pencil-shaped UAPs or UFOs. Really crazy stuff. So we got we got that everywhere we went, amazingly. Something in every place we went we had stuff messing with our equipment in very strange ways. Kinda of, kinda of like, you know, the whatever is was messing with the uh the electronics at our missile sites, right? You've heard about that, right? Yes. We we have a little movie short film called Nukes and Aliens or Aliens and Nukes, the Mario Woods story. Um, it's like 40 minutes, and it's, Mario Woods had this incredible experience out in the nuke field where he had a real profound contact with with some sort of alien craft and, and individuals, uh -huh. which is quite common out there. And as you know, there was a time in 2010 when the, the at F.E. Warren in Cheyenne, the, the missiles were taken offline for, for a while, and Obama was notified, and craft were sighted over the missile field at that time. So that that's available on YouTube, right, Alan? Yeah, on an, on our new network, the National Paranormal Network, that you can find on YouTube. That's also home to Trails the Unknown, which is the uh, paranormal road trip show that I run with my friends. You know, I have just been enjoying learning about y'all because as I was doing research and hitting different sites and stuff, there were it was like a rabbit trail, just following y'all's careers and what your what your plans are is interesting because the paranormal highway i'm very interested in watching i just think that's going to be just a neat experience how do you um when you start projects such as that or really with all the research you do because you both have such a strong background in your field how do you choose where to go? There's so many. So, so you, you mean we had, one of the, the conditions we, we wanted to have is that people would send us a video or something that convinced us there was something going on. And we wanted to have a host type person, a kind of Jim Myers, so, somebody or a couple in one case who are at these places and have had more, multiple experiences with the phenomena, the paranormal phenomena. Mm -hmm. We figure we figure that the human consciousness plays some role that I can't quite talk about right now in these in these types of events. So though that's that these are the defining criteria. And of course they would have to be willing to go on camera and take us take us to their places and and help us in our investigations. And we would usually spend maybe three days recording and nights um and every time we got some cool stuff always surprising very surprising you know it's it's 
Of course, it has to be surprising. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be paranormal, right? True that. Well, I know that I have been taken by surprise several times on various investigations. Sometimes it seems that the phenomenon has a sense of humor. That it's that it's sentient. And at that point, you just have to go, well, okay. I'm still here. They didn't hurt me. So it's all good, right? <laughs> Have y'all run into those experiences too? What do you think, Alan? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's You're just part of the beast, us. isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, the, the thing I've come to learn is you just, they're going to give you what they're going to give you. So you just have to be ready for whatever it is. And every time it's been something different. Um, and, and every time it's been the opposite of what I was expecting. So um, expect the unexpected. And when, it, when, when they give it to you, recognize that something yes. just happened. Don't, don't just ignore it. But, you know, that noise I just heard shouldn't have been there. And that was significant. You know, that's all you have to do. Just acknowledge it. So Alan's a bit of a sensitive, okay. a growing, growing sensitive. He, he experiences some of the things that I don't. So he's, he's kind of like our resident and, he has these kinds of contacts at pretty much every place we go. Really, Alan? Well, it's it's one of those things where I, as I started doing this more and more and more, I, I, I started to know when things weren't right. And a lot of it's just intuition. You know, I've been in the woods a ton now and I know when something's not right. But then it started to become a little bit more. Um, I've met some people that are really in tune to this, some, some mediums and some other people that are similar to that. Um, and they've, sort of show me some things um they've allowed me to to feel and see things um with their help and and in some ways that's um allowed me to open myself up to that and 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 that's really all it was was if if you're if you're not afraid and you're open to it um you can have these experiences that are unlike any other experience you'll have have you ever come across an experience that you were not fearful of that turns out maybe you should have been no but but I, I i did have sort of the last experience actually that i really had um was not pleasant <laughs> um i don't think it was out to hurt me but it definitely um it didn't go the way that i expected it was a it was it was not a, a positive experience let's just put it that way sorry, talking that about happened. the one in wisconsin yeah, and this happened um, in, when we were in Wisconsin, not in the Bray Road area, but uh, in the, what was it called? The, the Kettle Moraine? Yeah, State Forest. Yeah, in the State Forest. Um, everybody else had the opposite experience. You know, I'm kind of an old guy, and I was so rejuvenated, I was bouncing down the trail, like, usually I'm the laggard, and uh, everybody else was feeling... Um, like they were home safe and everything was so there was some presence going on there and it was affecting all of us in, in our own unique way and poor alan he got kind of pushed down with something heavy but i was able to release it from him eventually yeah yeah i tried to um i tried to do a meditation and, and make connection with what was there i mean we we all knew and heard things we knew we weren't alone in the woods that night Right. Um, so I tried to sort of just, I, I found a tree a little off the trail and I just put my back to it facing down into the kettle, um, where the, I, I felt like it was. And I just tried to sort of meditate and eventually heard little noises coming up behind me and, and, and felt like I, I could feel a presence coming from behind me. And then Ron was kind of like, yeah, we're, we're done here. Let's wrap up and go. But I was sort of right in the middle of this connection. So I, I got up and met with the group and we were sort of debriefing and, and doing a wrap up little video shoot there. And it felt like I was three times heavier. And I, felt, I literally felt like I was sinking into the dirt and I kept looking down at my feet and they were f firmly planted on the ground, but it kept feeling like I was sinking. And then as they walked away, I couldn't keep up. My legs were just heavy. Oh my and each, word. Each step was harder than the next step. And, and they're getting further and further away. And, and now to the point where, um, I'm getting slower and there, it seemed like they were speeding up and I could see where they were, but they, you know, it, it, I would have had to really yell to get their attention. And then I started hearing 
things in the woods moving closer to me and all these things. So I trying to walk faster and I just can't. And I finally, we got to the car and um, I just said to Ron, I said, something's not right. I, I don't feel right. And, and he was able to sort of help me and it just sort of went away from there. And I don't really know what it was, but it was a interesting experience for sure. Yeah. Jay Bachokin, our host, you know, goes out into the him. woods yeah. to, 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 totally geared up. And at the, and his, his experience of the same phenomena was that it told him in his kind of like mind speak, turn everything off. And he turned everything off and said that he had never done that in the woods and he was always kind of fearful. And when, when, when he turned everything off, he felt like he was at home, safe as he has ever been. And our cameraman said he felt like, like he had never been so calm and, and happy to be in the woods. Usually he's on edge because he's not used to the woods. So, and I, and I, like I said, I was like bounding down the road, which is why we were moving so fast because I was like returned to a 20 year old. So, I never felt I never felt in danger I mean maybe a little just because I heard the noises but it was definitely an uneasy feeling because I didn't feel like I had full control of my motor functions at that point but I don't think it was knowing what was creating that yeah I don't think it was malicious but it it wanted to get my attention and it did (laughs) so it got everybody's attention in its own very yes personal way which is what all these things seem to be they're all kind of designed for each individual personally as far as we can see yes and we're going to go to our news break but i would like to continue that thought that the experiences are created individually for us because i think you're right with that so and i would like to hear your reasons for that but um we will be right back this is our top of the hour news break and you know what i say If you can hear a little good news, that's always a great day. And I'm ever hopeful. So enjoy, and we'll see you when this is over. Live from NPR News, I'm Janine Herbst. French President Emmanuel Macron and Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke by phone today in hopes of working toward a ceasefire agreement in Ukraine. As NPR's Joe Hernandez reports, violence that broke out in eastern Ukraine has tensions higher than ever. Shelling from Russian-backed rebels in eastern Ukraine reportedly killed two Ukrainian soldiers and wounded others on Saturday, the Ukrainian military said. A day later, Macron and Putin discussed setting up a meeting to weigh a potential ceasefire in the country. Country. After their call, Macron spoke with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, who vowed to respect any possible ceasefire agreement. The Kremlin denies any plans to invade Ukraine, but Russia has continued to amass troops at the border and conduct military exercises. Top Ukrainian officials have called for a diplomatic end to the crisis. Joe Hernandez, NPR News. And President Biden and Macron also spoke by phone today. As COVID-19 cases come down around the country, more states are dropping mask mandates and recommendations, including Kentucky. Karen Zarr from member station WUKY has more. Governor Bashir has said at the rate COVID-19 numbers are falling, Kentuckians could expect indoor masking recommendations to end soon. Some school districts in the state have forged ahead and made masking optional. Others are following suit next week. If you get it, you're not going to die. That was Governor Bashir's message to Kentuckians last week on the COVID shots. State data show that in the last 11 months, only 17.7 percent of those who died of COVID were vaccinated. That number dropped below 2 percent for those younger than 60. Bashir said that means, quote, virtually every death we've had under 60 was avoidable. For NPR News, I'm Karen Zarr in Lexington. Eighty years ago this weekend, more than 100,000 people of Japanese descent were forced from their homes and moved to so-called relocation centers. Many were American citizens. John Lewis of member station KRCC reports one of those centers in southeast Colorado is set to become a national historic site. Some 7,000 people were incarcerated during World War II behind the barbed wire that enclosed Camp Amachi near Grenada, Colorado. Derek Akubo's father was among them. Akubo says this history has often been ignored. If we're to grow as a country, we have to face our demons and we have to be willing to feel things that we aren't willing to feel. 
and to uh, think about things we don't want to think about. U.S. Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland joined descendants of those confined there and others at the site over the weekend. She says it's the National Park Service's job to lift up these stories so people can learn from them. For NPR News, I'm Shauna Lewis. Wall Street's closed tomorrow in observance of the President's Day holiday. This is NPR News. Former Israeli Supreme Court Justice Gabriel Bach has died. He grew up in Nazi Germany and decades later worked to convict a Nazi perpetrator. And here's Daniel Estrin has more from Jerusalem. Gabriel Bach died Friday at the age of 94. He was the deputy prosecutor in the high-profile trial of Adolf Eichmann, a senior Nazi official who organized the mass deportation and killing of Jews. After the war, Israeli agents kidnapped Eichmann and brought him to Jerusalem, where he stood trial in 1961 and was found guilty of crimes against humanity. It was a landmark case that brought the stories of the Nazis' atrocities to the world stage. Bach himself spent his childhood in Nazi Germany, and as a prosecutor, he played a central role, inviting Holocaust survivors to appear as witnesses in the trial. Bach went on to become an Israeli Supreme Court justice. He was buried Sunday in Jerusalem. Daniel Estrin, NPR News, Jerusalem. Rents around the country are soaring, and that's causing many to fall behind on payments. Realtor.com says the median rent jumped 19.3 percent from December of 2020 to December of 2021 in the 50 largest metro areas. Experts say many factors are responsible, including a shortage of housing around the country, extremely low rental vacancies, and unrelenting demand as young adults continue to enter the crowded market. Analysts, though, are expecting rents to continue to rise this year, but at a slower pace thanks to increased construction. I'm Janine Herbst, and you're listening to NPR News. This message comes from PwC. Learn how the new equation brings together business-led, cloud-forward technologies to drive secure, tax-efficient business transformation. Visit thenewequation.com. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Welcome back for the second hour of Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. I'm Kat Hobson, your host, and I am just really enjoying myself tonight. My guests are Ron Meyer and Alan McGargle. And Ron, I'm going to ask you, because I have pronounced this both ways, is it Meyer or Mayer? Thank heavens. Well, I am, I am absolutely enjoying our conversation, you have got one of the more interesting and diverse documentary histories I've seen. You you own a production company, Center Communications, and you have directed, what, four? Four feature films? And that includes the, the Legend of the Spirit Dog, You've authored novels, Um, your latest being Bigfoot Singularity. You lead flow workshops. I love that you're a black, a fifth degree, no less, black belt in Aikido and the fossil collections. I'm really looking forward to your upcoming work. So I'm glad that you're here. And Alan is... um, Alan is big in the UF in the Bigfoot community. He has um, done his Bigfoot expeditions, and now he does. He was in Ohio, and now he's in Colorado, and he's done documentaries: the Back Eighty, Ghosts and Ghost Towns, Haunting the Midwest, the Bigfoot Alien Connection Revealed, which is absolutely fascinating you can see that just about anywhere and i chose amazon prime but and he produced the film minerva monster so i think that the bigfoot adventure weekends especially in colorado would be so much fun did you enjoy the one that well obviously you did enjoy the one that you did in ohio how did you come to be on that trip on that expedition talking to me now i am 
Well, we were doing this series, five-part series called Chasing Bigfoot. I was hired by uh, you know, distribution company to produce a five-part series on the Bigfoot phenomenon, whatever that might be. And so actually I had I had I had not known anything about Bigfoot except of course I'd seen the Patterson Gimlin film like pretty much everybody mm -hmm. has. And uh it's clear that people were using Bigfoot as sort of a a marketing tool. And I would say that's about what I knew about Bigfoot when I started. And um my daughter uh Anna uh was was somewhat interested in the project when it was pitched. She kind of has an interest in the paranormal and I said, "Well, you want to do something on Bigfoot?" So she kind of took on the project in a and setting up a lot of a lot of the places we we're going to do and doing the research. And one of the, one of the things that fascinated, well, I wanted to go to one of these Bigfoot conferences. There, there's quite a quite a community of Bigfoot researchers yes, or indeed. just people who are interested, as there is for UFOs, right? Just people about anything seeing, anomalous, yes. Yeah, they all have their own groups and communities and they argue amongst themselves and all that sort of stuff and i wanted to go to one of these um bigfoot uh conventions conferences and it was in ohio and it was it was fun i got some really good interviews and made contacts that that helped push the project forward but one of one of the people that i met was alan and his partner jesse and I and they told me about what they did, you know, this kind of family weekend where people go out in the woods and look for Bigfoot and have have an experience. And I thought, well, that would make an interesting addition to the series to show that how the Bigfoot phenomena has expanded and grown in some unusual and fun ways. And so we came to film it. it was one of the hardest filming situations. There were so many cicadas we could hardly get any oh, decent wow. audio. But yes. uh, my daughter was there, and uh, she kind of met Alan's eyes and uh, whoops, rest. <laughs> and then something happened, kind of weird, you know. <laughs> now, now, now we're sitting here talking to each other. I think that's fun. But, but like I said, it was actually Jim Myers who, who owns the Outpost. I interviewed a lot of people that had experiences, and I could see that that they weren't lying and I and I noticed right away that what we sort of ended up speaking about is that these things seem to be contact experiences seem to be designed yes. for the individual they had profound impacts on their lives and and most of them were, were kind of closeted meaning that they they didn't talk about them publicly or just beginning to and as you know there's kind of a new sort of religion a moving spiritual but not religious or kind of phenomena growing right now that that's incorporating the paranormal along with you know the the myths from the minds from called you know I want to believe and the truth is out there from the x files right and so that that means I don't believe now but I think I can believe in that there's actually a truth that can be discovered in the future and uh, and that these things that are happening, or at least being spoken about now, you know, there's these, there are these people that that are almost all, every great innovation was seemed to come through some sort of amazing download of information, you know, from from yes. Newton to Einstein to every quantum discovery. Uh, people have had these kind of remarkable downloads of information that's. It's turned out to be these great theories of physics or evolution or every aspect of technology. Um, so where was I? I forgot. I'm losing track here. <laughs> the downloads and that people feel that this is how we're being advanced, I think. Yes, and, and that these, these contact experiences were were designed for them and then when Jim Meyer said, "I don't, I don't think that Bigfoot 
could actually be a creature, you know, an unknown primate running around on, on, you know, like a bear or something that had these experiences. The people described that there were just always a few footprints, right? Yes. Like it was a call, like a calling card. You never like followed tracks, three hundred tracks someplace like you would if you were tracking a exactly you know, a bear or a deer or something. That would, you could follow them quite easily. So, so it always and so there are these things where people would would say, well, they just sort of disappeared or merge into a tree or, and of course I found out that there were cases where people had actually encountered Bigfoot and UFOs or UAPs at the same time. So it, it sort of made sense to me. I couldn't, I couldn't, I could not believe that there was, there was a missing cryptid here that that's actually a living mammal that has to eat food and take a crap and have water and hunt down other things and eat it. It just didn't, didn't make sense to me. There was really no evidence that was taking place. Well, especially the, with the number of people who are seeking that creature and the different yeah, no methodologies kidding. in use. I mean, at some point, someone should have found a carcass or, you know, a sick Bigfoot that needed help. I mean, as much as they are supposed to interact with us, and they do, but I don't think that it's as a cryptid so much as just a being and to visit with your idea of them being dimensional or alien then there are many reports some by by Bigfoot researchers that I have a lot of confidence in have flashes prior to the the creatures appearing and yeah, you know, like flashes around the corner as it comes toward them or other things it it's not your normal cryptid like one of the monsters or because they seem to be almost universal in their behavior patterns too mothman um whatever it is it's flying around chicago there's so many different things but bigfoot has a strange way of showing up sometimes, doesn't he? Yeah, and and it it never there's no uniformity to the descriptions of people that see them, from kind of skinny white, white white haired creatures mm-hmm. to, you know, baby type things. You know, it's it, it's a huge variety. Even even um, uh, Cliff Barockman, you know, who's, who's who's clearly flesh and blood at least in his public persona. Mm-hmm. But if you talk to these people that were doing finding Bigfoot, like Bobo, if you if you talk to them, they'll say, "Yeah, we had lots of paranormal experiences." We, the showrunner, just didn't let us talk about them. Oh, Plus, we're, that would have been good. Uh, yeah. So a- Alan, Alan, pretty much is a, is is what I would consider to be somebody who transitioned from the hairy creature to paranormal. Are you there, Alan? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's true. I mean, I started out um, in Ohio working with the Ohio Bigfoot Conference, and eventually I was part of the BFRO and doing expedition or um, investigations for those guys. Um, and then I started having experiences that sort of didn't fit that mold, and it really wasn't until um, Ron talked to me about wanting to do some projects like this that I really started to to think more outside the box, but I could go back, you know, many years and and find experiences that, that I didn't really put in this bucket, but now that I would after thinking about them. So yeah, I I think, you know, the, the idea of running around the woods, trying to get footprints and uh, trying to get a hair sample to prove DNA and all those things. I just don't, I just, it's just not going to happen that way. I just don't see that happening. So I've sort of put that aside and now I'm looking for more what I would call these contact experiences where Mm -hmm. I have a close interaction. I don't necessarily need to see it. Um, I've, I've felt it, um, the presence of it, the, the, you know, I, have had many, many interactions where I, I knew what it was. I, I couldn't visually see it. Um, even up till last year, I mean, I've had, I've had contact experiences that lasted 
more than an hour where I'm interacting back and forth with various, you know, what I believe to be Bigfoot in the woods. So it, it can happen. I, I know, you know, we used to always talk uh, when we first got into this, me and my, my buddy, Jesse, that these people that go out in the woods and have something happen every time is just not possible. They're making things up and all that. Um, there still might be some truth to that, but I think the more that I did and the more open I became, the more things were happening. And I think just knowing what's going, what is happening and being in tune to that is, is the, is the tricky part because if you're looking for red eye shine and it may not happen that way. So you have to take what you're getting and then try to interpret that and try to make sense of it. So um, I've definitely come, come a long way. Um, I've, I've taken a lot of steps in the last couple of years where um, I have this, what I would, I, I sort of liken it to a, an, a spiritual connection almost where it can, can feel the energy from it now. Um, so I've, I've, I've been, most of it is filmed. You know, I, I take my camera everywhere. Obviously the things happening internal to my body are hard to film, but um, I've compiled a lot of that and I'm putting it together for a potential uh, film that I've been trying to work on. And I, I think it's going to potentially be called spiritual Bigfoot and we'll eventually probably have it on our YouTube channel. I'm, I'm hoping to do that here soon, but that kind of chronicles the journey that I have of trying to accept that it's not a monkey. <laughs> I understand. You know, it's, um, especially with some of the experiences you've described, but we have to take a quick break. We will be right back and thank you all for listening and come right back with us. You are listening to WBHM digital broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Paratalk Radio is your one stop for all things paranormal, the unknown, and the supernatural. Join us every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central for discussions and guests on topics such as ghosts, hauntings, Bigfoot, UFOs, and more. This broadcast is rated M for mature and intended for listeners over 16 on paratalkradio.com. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back. I am Kat Hobson and you are listening to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. 
I'm so glad you are because this show tonight has already been fantastic and it just keeps getting better. My guests are Ron Meyer and Alan McGargle. They are um, some of the most interesting men. They actually opened a portal, an alien portal, on their land in the Rocky Mountains. And it's going to be part of a new movie, Alien Contact in the Rockies. I am just, yeah, I told you, Ron, that that y'all are the only people I know who have done this. And I'm just so fascinated. I can't wait for that that movie to to come out. Yeah, the men in black haven't visited us yet, so I think we're okay. That we know of, right, Ron? <laughs> that you know of. But Do you have any memory loss? <laughs> well, you got time? six old, so. <laughs> true, that's true. So, yeah, I wonder if they're even still in business at this point. The men in black? Yes. Uh, well, Joe Hauser said he got a visitation up on his vortex recently. It's his uh, mystery place in, really? in Montana. Yeah. Creepy eyes and everything, I think he said. Didn't he, Alan? Yeah, he said like lizard-like eyes and that there were other people on the tour that came up to him afterwards and like, did you see those people? What was going on? Wow. That's interesting. So, yeah, who knows? <laughs> you know, in the Bigfoot Inn connection, we went up to to his places, you know, when we were developing this idea of paranormal hotspots. Did you, and we we had this really weird we didn't really get much there in a way but he showed us some video he captured on I think it's a security camera right Alan? Maybe yeah it was a security it. camera of uh, something kind of shadow like that showed up in the mystery house that he says was his resident Bigfoot who he and his wife have a kind of mind speak relationship with and um, so we're in the in, we're Alan and, and Anna, my daughter and his wife, are in there talking to him, and he's saying, "Yeah, the Bigfoot shows up right here, in the in the middle of the mystery house." And for some reason, I'm outside filming through the window. I don't know why I was doing that, but anyhow, I did, and I was I wasn't really seeing. I was it was on a monopod, so I was holding it up. And when we got back, when he says this, the, the Bigfoot shows up right here and I can feel his presence and hear his footsteps, but I can't see him. I captured on on my footage a kind of fairy moth-like creature, white as could be, and it, and it was not being illuminated by the sunlight because the sunlight was at my back. So, and it flew in, and it, it was probably the size of somebody's hand, you know, an adult hand, mm-hmm. and nobody saw it. But there it was. It was almost like, so you think I'm a seven-foot Bigfoot? Well, heck, I'll show you I'm actually the size of a a fairy moth, and I can appear that way whenever I want. So that I found that really fascinating. It looks like it's got a real sense of humor there, doesn't it? Absolutely. From great, big, and scary to small and pretty. Exactly. And it's exhibiting capabilities that we can only see sometimes. But I think I think we're so I was saying to you on the break that I think we as human beings have greater potential than uh, than we normally let on. And and I think you know from now in terms of this, the science and neuroscience that pretty much what we see and experience in our mind, you know, in our consciousness our, as a matter of experience is as a result of our brain creating a model and showing us what it wants to do. Uh, how, so we're, ne- we're never really seeing what we see or hearing what we hear. It's what our brain decides we're going to see in here. It yes. makes it up as a model. And in the limit, and so once in a while, like when you take psychedelics or have these unusual experiences, maybe through trauma, like near-death experiences, that the filter that the brain creates for us is somehow removed and we get a greater sense of who we are and what the world really is. I have heard people share that that was very similar, a very close description to their experiences. 
I think it's a little scary. I think it's exciting. You know, we're, we're more than we think we are. Well, I, I do love that. And, but I think going off into the jungles with medicine men who are controlling the, the experience for you would be a little bit concerning. I would probably be uptight. And well, just, then you pro probably have a negative experience then. Well, either that or it would release the inhibitions and allow me to experience what my friends have, you know, when they go, go to do that. It's such a spiritual journey. It is. That was the yeah. part that, that I realized was that I was the one blocking these things from happening. I wouldn't allow it to happen. My brain wouldn't let it happen. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until, um, really, I, I worked with a medium when we were filming in Oregon. Her name was Tish. And she she talked me through a meditation that led me to a Bigfoot contact experience. And I would have not been able to do that on my own. Um, but now I think I, I could, at least to some degree, do that having been through it once now so but it was all about just sort of letting go letting your guard down letting l letting it happen basically letting the control relinquishing the control yeah i think that's important i think that's important in a lot of aspects of life and that people do tend to miss out because they're unable to do that yeah that, that being able to do that has actually helped me in other parts of my life to, to either gain focus or relieve stress or other things like that. Uh, just being able to sort of let go of that when you need to is a very helpful uh, skill, I would call it. I would agree. I try to do that, especially with some of the, the metaphysical people that I talk to who do guidance work for other people. And it just is always interesting to me how people are, you know, how their clients or friends are able to just drop that hat and in the experience. I try to live in my experiences, but some things make me very nervous about the paranormal. I've been doing it for decades, and it seems like some people are trying to create more of an environment of fear. Um, of I, UFOs, I agree. Of... I agree. I think most of the experiences I've had, I could look back on now and think there was not a fear component to it. Whether I felt fear or not, wasn't. it didn't matter, but I didn't, I didn't need to. I, I didn't have exactly. to. Um, exactly. You know, I've, I've had craft around me on numerous occasions and I'm not afraid. I mean, there was actually one over my house that came out of a cloud and pulled back into it and then went on its way. And I was on the phone with someone and I was just like, you know, stay on the phone for a minute. And if I go quiet, just time how long it lasts <laughs> kind of a thing. But... Because it was directly over me, and it did pull out just so I could see it. And I thought that was just bizarre. But back to the the psychedelics, I know a lot of people who are very good researchers because they're open because of that experience. So, Ron, I think you're right. That may be why you know, there's fearfulness. Not just in me, but... But in, I think the cryptids field makes me more nervous because I know people who have done a lot of investigating of that nature. Aliens don't bother me. And just the cryptids that, you know, could do more than scare you bothers me. I don't know. It's just interesting, the things that are out there. It what is. is have y'all have y'all been up with the um the Olympic project? In, in, in the Oregon? North Sure. I, actually it's actually in uh, Washington, I believe. Thank you. 
I, one of the women with that group, um, is very informative and she's who actually first taught me how to be in the woods through discussion, but there's a lot to being prepared to go because if you're in Bigfoot country, you're usually in bear and coyote and all the other things that like to, you know, eat meat <laughs> that are, <laughs> are potentially hunting. Have you had encounters that made you um, feel like other than something dragging your heels, Alan, do you, have you felt like you were in potential threatening environments from something other than what you were looking for? No, that's, that's never happened to me. All the experiences I've, I've had have, have been positive ones. And like I said, some of them at the time with my inexperience early on, you know, felt fearful because I didn't understand what was happening. But in hindsight, there was nothing I ever really felt in danger. There was nothing where I ever left. All the encounters I've ever had, I stayed until it was over. Well, there's no sense in doing what you're doing if you're going to run from it. And that's how I, I get myself through any trepidation I may have. Sure. And a lot of people like to carry, you know, guns and firearms and weapons and stuff. And, and that's something I've ever felt I needed to do. Um, I have bear spray just to protect from animals and things like that. But um, I, I wouldn't approach it like that. I wouldn't approach it with fear because what you're going to get back is not what you want. I think you have to approach it for what it is. And it's yes. it's not something to be afraid of. Well, and I think that animals sense fear. So if it's Bigfoot aliens, then they would too. Yeah, so and you're I not think doing yourself a favor either way. It's yeah, I, I believe that. I believe that if uh if if you are fearful then they will sense that and you won't get the experience or you won't get the type of experience that you sought out to get. Um I think I think it, it I don't know, it's it's not just this a, a power of this being. It, to your point, it's anyone could really see if you're scared. It's pretty obvious. That's true, but peop but Animals seem to have such a heightened awareness of smell. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because they're really very cool. And the people that I know who are seeing these creatures don't seem to have fear at all. Now, yeah, the, the witnesses that I've talked to that, that do experience fear, it's because they were minding their own business. They didn't have Bigfoot on their minds at all. And all of a sudden... There it was, and they you know, they weren't prepared for it. They weren't ready for it. They didn't want it. Um, I could see we, that would easily cause fear. You know, that's life changing kind of fear for people. But it's also, you know, if if you're if you're comfortable with it, it's it's not a fear you have to have. It's not something that you necessarily have to be afraid of. Exactly. Well, I think it's almost like a calling, right? If you're if you are drawn to it to the level that you are, in your case, you're making your career based on your fascination with this topic and you know, you're seeking experiences and such. So I just think that people like you tend to make people like me, if I were, you know, saying so low or just with a couple of people stomping through my woods your attitude and your background and the things that you share through your work would help to make that easier yeah and that's for me everything that I really do is is about that I'm not you know out here trying to make money off this I have a very good you know day job right <laughs> that pays the bills this is not this is not that for me well, for me it's always love. been yeah, well, it's about education and sharing, and that's what Bigfoot Adventure Weekends was about for me, was to, to be able to, to share this and let other people have experiences. I mean, for me, that's the ultimate thing during one of these weekends, is if somebody that I took out in the woods has an experience similar to one that I had, I'm beyond thrilled. That's like such an honor for me to be able to be with someone when they have their first experience. And same with the films, it's about, you know, bringing new information out and, and sharing my experiences with people. 
um, th that's really what it's about for me is education and, and just telling the stories. There's a lot of stories out there that are not your standard Bigfoot stories. And those are the ones that I want to, you know, flush out and, and get in front of people. So that's, what's important to me. And oh yeah. I'm sorry, Ryan. I was just going to say that's a very important thing to be well, doing. Yeah. What, 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 from my point of view, I want to create sort of a, a safe narrative or story that allows people to have these experiences and share them because they're really revelations of a greater truth, a spiritual truth, if you like. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's important. And I, and I think there's an evolutionary component that we're, we're actually getting insights and awarenesses that weren't available before. And this is part of that new kind of religiosity that's, that's emerging spiritual but uh, not religious by, by the way if you're a young person and you're on a dating site it's one of the alternatives you can check and really? it's the one that's the one that's checked the most how do you know that Ron? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say but but what were you doing there Ron? So. <laughs> passing it on to somebody no I don't know it's, it, actually I haven't actually checked it but I've heard where people speak about it that way that they that they look at these sites. So so it's a growing it's growing and it's becoming more common. And uh I know that that a lot of the traditional religious scenarios and stories and and so on have a have a dark component to them, the devil, you know, and that sort of thing. In fact one of our investigations we went with a couple a couple who look at it from that standpoint that they cleanse themselves before and after. And I think, you know, they, they experienced fear. Would you say, Alan? Oh, talking? for sure. For sure. You know, don't do that. Don't go there. You know, that, those kinds of things. Oh. So, um, it, it, you bring some baggage from your, from the stories you've been told, you know, since you were a kid and so on that are pretty deeply seated. But you start having experiences that can shake you out of that and open you up to a greater truth and a greater destiny for who you are, really, and what the world is about. That, I would agree with that. That is what the world is about. But I'm going to be honest with y'all, and I've never told anybody this. My fear stems from having laid down to watch the stars one night and hearing something hissing, I thought it was a snake, and I turned around, and it was a really, really mad possum. Huh. And they are their own monsters. Yes, they are. <laughs> that that would scare me. I think the the possum might be the one that gets me. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't it's do funny. anything. They just sit there, kind of. No, like they do not. Yes. <laughs> no, they do not. Uh, they will. They are sneaky little things, with really right. sharp teeth. I think they're cute. <laughs> as long as it's not trying to, you know, move you. And I wasn't even in its way. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, don't, you know, well, don't go to Australia. You'll be surrounded by marsupials. I know. But this one was just, like I said, it was it was angry. And I thought they were supposed to lay down and play dead, and it did not. Think yeah. that it was supposed to do that. It was hilarious, I guess, in retrospect. That, sh that was before cell phone cameras because I'm sure somebody would have posted that. It would have been hilarious. But we are going to take our last break, and I have had such a great time talking with y'all, but we'll be back to do it just a little bit more. Y'all come back with us too. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. 
I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back for the final segment of Fate Mag Radio, and I am so glad y'all are here. This has been uh, very interesting and fairly diverse show. I have had such a great time. And Ron and Alan, thank y'all very much. I wanted, before we went another minute in, for y'all to tell people how to find you and find your work. Um, I've got a lot of the links in the event, but for those listening, would you share? So... Bigfoot and Connection Revealed, you can watch it free on Tubi TV and on YouTube. Um, it was on Amazon Prime for quite a while as a as a freebie, but they booted it off now, and uh, you have to pay to, to pay a small fee to watch it now. Um, the nu- Nukes and Aliens, the Mario Woods story, that's available on... Uh, on Alan's site, his paranormal site, and, and it's on YouTube. The Chasing Bigfoot is all over the place. You know, when, yes, when, you, produce, when, you, when you produce these things for, for a distributor, you don't necessarily control how it's released and where it goes. The, um, the new movie, Alien Contact in the Rockies, is, is coming out, I've been told, towards the end of May. And it'll probably be on multiple platforms. I have another another movie that's on on Apple TV, which is called The Paranormal Mind Lifting the Veil to a Greater Reality. And it kind of summarizes my philosophy of all the paranormal phenomena. So that that was just released this month, last month, this month. And it'll probably be on more streaming platforms as time goes on. And if you like serial killers, I, I've done a lot of stuff on serial killers. That was like the number one selling or rated number one film. Document, documentary documentary se- on silly, serial killers. Yes. That's it's amazing. Because there's a yeah. lot of those. Women love serial killers. You I don't know why that is. Me either. But it's true. They're the main audience for true crime, particularly serial killers. And uh, right right now I'm doing a series on the genius of African American music, which is quite interesting. That would be. And the Paranormal Highway will probably be out in the fall. It's a five part television hour series that I think will be very cool for people to see for the the kind of stuff we captured. So, and uh, the our publish. The publisher of our science fi- fiction book, Alien 20, Aliens 2035, The End of Technology, has asked us to write a companion book to the movie, The Bigfoot Alien Connection Revealed, and so I'm in the process of doing that with my writing buddy. It will be kind of a an overview and a sort of guide to the things, the patterns we discovered in our investigations. How about you, Alan? What do you, what do you got up your sleeve? 
<laughs> well, um, me and my business partner, Jesse Morgan, we just released the National Paranormal Network on YouTube. It's uh, all original free content, uh, including our documentary film, The Back 80, which is now available for free on there. Um, definitely check that out. That's um, We're really proud of that. Um, if you're interested in your own Bigfoot adventure and you want to make your way out to Colorado, you can go to BigfootAdventureWeekends.com. Um, there's tickets available for this year's event, which is at the end of July. We'll be premiering the Alien Contact and the Rockies film at the Bigfoot Days in Estes Park first weekend in April. So if you, again, can make it out to Estes Park, Colorado, um, you can be one of the first people to see the movie. And Cliff Berrickman's going to be here and some of the guys from Mountain Monsters. And it's going to be a great weekend. So please come out and check out that. And then we got the event that's connected to this, which is, um, what exactly is the name of the... The Ozark UFO Conference. Absolutely. Is, and, and we'll we're, be speaking there. And we're going to yeah. screen the the Mario Woods story there. Yeah, which is also on our YouTube, the, the uh, Aliens and Nukes, you can see on our National Paranormal Network on YouTube. And we also have the uh, Trails to the Unknown series, which is my original paranormal um series where we we do all these different kind of adventures and there's lots of content online for that so we appreciate all any support you guys have please subscribe to our channel we're trying to build it up and uh yeah that's all well you know y'all are going to have so many people at ozark i'm hoping if that, that it's going to stay you know face to face but i don't see any reason why not i think that it's one of my favorite conferences to go to. And Are you going to be there? I am going to be there. Well, and you have to buy us a drink. I could probably be talked into that, but you're buying dinner. <laughs> so, <laughs> but seriously, I am looking forward to meeting y'all. I think that... Have you been to Ozark? No. Their conference? No, the first time. It's a very interesting town. And there are really neat places to to see for it to be such a small location. But the conference itself is really great. I think you're going to have so much fun. So far, our interaction with the organizers has been really good. Yeah, we're really looking forward to it. It's going to be a great weekend. Well, they're very good at their organization. So I've... I've been to conferences where people were not quite as focused on that, but this this conference seems to be just kind of stays on schedule and flows with it. So, but I will tell you that I was there and it was about 50 degrees and all of a sudden it was 26 degrees. So bring a jacket. <laughs> Because I did not. (laughs) And they're almost impossible to find because the seasons are changing. But, you know, you've got a lot of talent that is going to be there with y'all. That's some of the speakers there are going to be great. I was really interested about the the various hypotheses that y'all are going to share. And the the travel modes and such. You know, we discussed the portal, which you successfully opened on your property. But it's interesting because there's so many different uh, what are considered vortexes, which I think are very similar. I'm not sure what the difference is. But can you tell me that before we go? Well, one of the things we noticed... If you watch the series on the Skinwalker Ranch, the most recent Mm -hmm. season, their biggest event was at this kind of old uh, building that was probably used by the ranchers, you know, when they were out in the field doing their cattle stuff. And they got got a lot of activity, and, and they, using their thermals, they found that there was this huge temperature drop, which a a lot of people have described in relationship particularly to ghosts and apparitions, you know, mm-hmm. kind of a, a feeling of chill and cold, you know, yes. sudden drop in temperature. And in, in our investigations, we found one place in Oregon where 
on this this woman who's who's a sensitive and a scholar of the great mysteries. Uh, she said she had a portal, and we found this spot that it was an evening out there in the summer, and it was probably seventy some degrees, and the temperature in this isolated area dropped down to around thirty two degrees. Right, Alan? Yeah, we were able to uh, measure that with our um, thermal device. And then again, where the the possible appearance of the of the beast of Bray Road, we had a similar result, and people have said that this cold, this drop in temperature is is the opening of a portal, and I think that this drop in temperature may, maybe it relates to the coming. You could imagine that if something came through from outer space, say for example you know, in some sort of travel, it would, of course, be a lot colder coming coming from outer space, right? Absolutely. So so that's one hypothesis. But that seems to be in these ma- magnetic fluctuations that we recorded at our portal. Unfortunately, we didn't know about this temperature thing when we were, when our portal was there because we could have pulled out our thermal and see if there was anything like that going on. So that was a, a big miss on our part. But uh, I think it has something to do with, with something opening up and something coming through, and it's, there's this corresponding drop in temperature. It's, it's a pattern we've, we've observed and at least twice on ourselves, and we saw the same thing on, on the Skinwalker Ranch television program. And I think, Alan, you felt that when we were in the shed, right? You felt a coldness in, in Oregon? Yeah, I, I felt it uh, several different times, but... Yeah, a clear temperature shift for no reason. That's always interesting. Because you don't know what's coming, right? It's just that part's part of the mystery. It is. I love that part of it. You know, because you you don't know what you're going to get. Is it going to be spiritual paranormal? Is it going to be, you know, uh, alien paranormal? Is it going to be anything? I don't really want monsters to just teleport to where I am, but if they're coming, they're coming for a reason. It it it, it indicates that whatever it is, it can have a a real physical impact mm-hmm. on on our in our environment, right? That's yes. not nor- not normal to have that type of temperature drop. And have it be isolated into such a small area, so so there's some connection with whatever that is, and in our physicality in a way that's kind of fascinating to me. What about wormholes? Have y'all found a way to look for those, even if you may not have found one? Is there technology or methodology that you use? Not really. I mean, what describe what you mean by a wormhole besides like a bend that... in like a bend in time. Like something just point point A to point B in because that it's could a... actually happen to you know, dimensionally here in our environment, I believe. It wouldn't have uh, to be coming from far away. It's you certainly on um, you see it in Star Trek and these, it's it's certainly a staple of science fiction for it is for for, for alien activities to get around the uh, the limitation of the speed of light, right? Well, Einstein said that's the only way that you could beat the speed of light was by bending bending it, bending the black matter areas. I probably don't have my words right, but yes. I actually read that. Well, and I believe more... it was in one of his works. Could one be. Of his, one of his presentations. Well, because bending so, time, so... bending time. And I was just like, how do you bend time? And then I started you know, trying to find out what that was. And that was basically a wormhole as it's described in different, re- you know, different writings. I read the weirdest things. Well, you know, quantum mechanics is not very intuitive because 
uh, for in quantum mechanics, unlike relativity, mm -hmm. uh, time, time and space are not fundamental. Yeah. They're derivative. Um, so that makes it a little hard to figure out what in the hell they're talking about. I have a hard time with quantum. As you should. It's, it's not intuitive. And right? it doesn't, no, it's not at all. And I'm still trying to understand how a quantum computer even functions. So I'm, I'm befuddled by quantum. <laughs> and that's okay because eventually if it's something that you can figure out, I eventually will. But I have had such a great time with you gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. And um, I'm sorry for the, the circumstances that seem to have gotten me a little tight when I was starting the show, but I've enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you. We enjoyed talking with you. We sure did. Thanks so much, Kate. Take Absolutely. care. Y'all too. And we'll see you in uh, Ozark Springs. Indeed. All right. Have a great evening. Thank you again. Thanks. And for all of our listeners, thank y'all too. And we will see you next week here on Fate. I am looking forward to being able to have just all the things happening with Paranormal Experience on Wednesday. I think that we are going to just thoroughly enjoy ourselves. And see you next time. Thank you again. Good night. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama.